Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> Good evening and welcome to MIT. Uh, my name is Eric Adams and I'm one of eight members of the John R. Freeman Committee. And we're <clears throat> associated with the Boston Society of Civil Engineers section of ASCE. And BSCE is what annually puts on uh, this lecture. Many of you know that John Freeman was a graduate of MIT's Department of Civil Engineering. He was a world-renowned both mechanical and uh, uh, civil engineer, uh, working around the uh, turn of the previous century, <clears throat> known in the Boston area, among other things, for having designed the original Charles River Dam. He also was instrumental in the design of water distribution systems for a number of large cities, such as San Francisco and uh, New York City. The funds for this uh, lecture come from a gift he bestowed in 1925 on behalf <clears throat> for the purpose of the education of young uh, engineers in the various aspects of water, water wastewater, um, water resources, hydraulic engineering. Uh, in addition to this uh, lecture, uh, some of the funds from his gift go to modest grants that uh, our committee grants to uh, students and also to uh, young profes professional uh, engineers, both in uh, private and public sector, to, to do educational activities. And if anybody is interested in uh, learning more about these grants or they have ideas about good topics for future Freeman lectures, uh, we'd appreciate if you could come and talk to somebody from the committee about that. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Reed Brockman, who is the head of uh, the BSCE this year. He's going to talk a little bit about some of the activities of BSCE, and following that, my colleague Phil Geschwin is going to introduce the main speaker. Reed? Thank you, and hi, everybody. I'm Reed Brockman. I'm the president of the Boston Society of Civil Engineers this year, and I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. And I want to tell you a little bit about BSES and some of the activities that are coming up. Um, a lot of things actually are really focused around MIT, especially in the next uh, months, um, because you have the Cambridge Science Festival coming up. So as part of the festival on the Saturday, the BSCES will be over at Cambridge Ridge in Latin. So if you can visit over there, we'll be running a bunch of hands-on activities um, using computers to design bridges and um, several other hands-on activities uh, aimed at kids. We'll also be giving, as you know, the Cambridge Science Festival something for all ages. And twice during the week on Monday during the marathon um, at 10 in the morning, and then on Wednesday, we will also be giving tours of Boston Bridges. And actually, one of the things um, we usually talk about on the Bridges tour is about the old Charles River Dam and uh, some of the stories behind it and some of the battles that went into the design. Uh, the BSCES Journal, a couple, was it the BSCES Journal? Might have been Structure Magazine. Uh, did a great um, article on that a couple of years ago where uh, they went through the whole story and the battle against uh, people claiming that the damming of the river was going to cause malaria and all kinds of stories like that. So that's something for you all to check out. Um, I just wanted to uh, tell you all that the BSCES is a group that tries to focus on giving you everything you'd need as a civil engineer, um, trying to encourage kids when in the K-12 level, help you out during college, um, and even a younger member and all the way through your career. Um, so it's always great to get involved with us and um, we're there for you and to help you any way you can. And I want to thank you all for coming and uh, enjoy. Thank you. Uh, my name is Phil Geschwend. I'm a professor here at MIT in civil and environmental engineering. And I kind of feel like I won an award to be able to introduce Professor McCarty tonight. <laughs> Um, for those of you who don't somehow know that, he's a Michigander, did his undergraduate work at Wayne State, uh, and then came here to MIT to do his graduate work both as a master's student and then later as a PhD student. And in particular, he was uh, very famous already for starting to work on the fundamentals of anaerobic wastewater treatment. Kind of an interesting connection to tonight's talk, I betcha. Uh, he actually did his PhD thesis on the significance of ion concentration. As a chemist, I love that part. Uh, in the anaerobic biochemical decomposition of acetate, aka vinegar. Anyway, it's a great 
start to his career. He then moved from MIT across the country and started the best environmental engineering group in the world. And I forever hate him for that part because we can never catch him. But anyway, he's outstanding and their group was outstanding. He was chairman of the department there in civil and environmental engineering in the 1980s. He served as the director of the Western Regional Hazardous Substances Group, another uh, wonderful group that uh, got a lot of work done. Um, he since was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 1977 and the Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1996. He received the John and Alice Tyler Prize for Environmental Ch Achievement in 1999, and to quote them, he, they honored him as the world's leading environmental engineering wor wor engineer working to protect the Earth's water resources. I'd have a hard time arguing with that, actually. It breathes way up there. And then later on, he was awarded the Stockholm Water uh, Prize in 2007 for his pioneering work in developing the scientific approach for the design and operation of water and wastewater system. He has, they say, done great work in the fundamental microbiology and chemistry and the of a wide array of things that have to do with treatment and bioreactors and all this kind of thing. And I think the key words there are wide array. I just want to give you a quick, quick notion of some of the things he's worked on. I basically took one paper from each decade of his career. Mostly the papers I have to quote in my own classes, by the way, so that makes it easier for me. But some time ago, he started out, as I mentioned, doing anaerobic work, and right away he noticed that certain pesticides disappeared under anaerobic conditions. What's up with that? Now an organic chemist like me has to kind of understand what's going on in anaerobic conditions that makes DDT and lindane, et cetera, do their thing. That was a long time ago. But he doesn't get stuck in the mud. He keeps going. He goes on and starts working on films, biofilms. And he, with Bruce Rittman and others, he went into the big story, well, how do biofilms help organisms use substrates? How do we describe the kinetics of all that, et cetera? But not sticking on just that topic, he now moves on and starts to understand the transformations of chlorinated solvents under methanogenic conditions, under very reducing conditions. How do these things start to happen? These chemicals are going away underground and What's going on with that? There's the people who did the work. And in particular, they started doing work where they would actually go to real field sites and who have lots of wells in the ground. And the rest of us are now copying Stanford as they have these wonderful field experiments seeing what happens when you change the subsurface and see what happens to things like chlorinated solvents. Fantastic in my point of view. Continuing, that's just four decades, keep going on. <laughs> He moved on with various other people. And this is one of my all-time favorites. I remember hearing this at the Gordon Conference, but I'll just quote the science paper. Micro, microorganisms can breathe with chlorinated solvents. Not oxygen, not nitrate, not sulfate. With chlorinated solvents, for goodness sake, they can breathe. And then he proceeds to explain the microbiology and chemistry of how that works. And everybody's going, well, duh, how come we didn't think of that? Perry McCarty thought of it, that's why. Anyway, moving right along to the next decade, he continues to start to understand now, how do you go to these field sites and manipulate the subsurface for this kind of thing to happen so that we remove these solvents when especially they're included as a Dean apple. We can't just work on the solvents. Now we gotta bring the Dean apple problem into the story. It's a fantastic extra extension of what all has been done. This is now six decades or whatever it's been. I can't even keep track anymore. All of these I have to quote in my class every, every semester. Finally. A new topic, ha, ha, ha. He moves back to anaerobic treatment and starts to say, wait a minute, you guys are crazy. We're throwing away all the resources. We should fix that. I absolutely agree, and I'm really excited tonight to hear him talk about it and explain to us how is he going to go about doing this. And I would love to know the answer, cause, and so will all of you. Perry, take it away. <laughs> How can I how can I follow that? that <laughs> thanks so much, Phil. Phil, that was the most wonderful introduction I've ever had. <laughs> well, I really pleased, so pleased, and I'm really so, so highly honored to be invited by my alma mater and uh, the Boston Society of Civil Engineers to give the Freeman lecture this year. I would I would just. Um, Recalling 19, about 1969, I was invited to give a talk at the Boston Society of Civil Engineers, and it was by Tom Camp. And I don't know if the students here remember Tom Camp, I'm sure a lot of you do, but he was a professor 
at uh, MIT and sanitary engineering, as we called it, from the 20s to the early 40s. And um, then he went on to, to uh, form the firm uh, Camp Dresser and McKee, which is now CDM Smith here in Boston. Um, he's first PhD student. In fact, the first PhD student in sanitary engineering at MIT was of Wolf Eliasson. A few years after Tom Camp retired, Rolf Eliasson came into the program and headed it up at about 1949. And he was here when I came. Um, Rolf was also an undergraduate at MIT. Um, and um, so one day after, after I finished my degree and was teaching here, uh, Rolf called me in his office and uh, he said, you know, California's got some really water quality problems. Um, and they do, you know, they've uh, said it's, it's just uh, the place to be for dealing with, uh, with water. And, uh, you know, as you say, uh, was a Mark, Mark Twain said that, uh, you know, whiskey is for drinking. Water is for fighting, and they have been fighting ever since, and they are, this year they're really fighting over, over water. So it was very interesting. So he said, um, Stanford has a broad water resources program. It has economics, and, and um, plus the hydraulics and fluid mechanics and so forth, and they're working with law and professional. So um, it's what I'd like to do. And so I decided to leave MIT, and so he said, uh, you want to come with me? Well, Rolf's a pretty persuasive man, so I said yes, and as Phil said, we started the program there and have been there ever since. Well, the water is, water is a, a major issue there, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that when I first went to California as far as using water as a resource and not as a waste. You know, so much of us in the past thought, of, well, it's a waste, we've got to get rid of it. Let's do what we can to hide it someplace or do what we have to, to get, get it out away from us. But in California, they were already seeing the water shortage coming up and were doing, beginning and doing what they could on reclamation. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the things they're doing there. But I uh, also want to talk about some work that uh, last five years, I got invited by um, my, one of my former students, uh, Jay Obey there, I'm showing you, Professor Jay Obey. Uh, Korea had a program, a five-year program called World Class University Program in which they uh, supported um, uh, senior people, not old people, senior people like myself, to come and work with them. Uh, so we put in a proposal. I always wanted to get back to sewage. The reason I moved away from dealing with uh, anaerobic treatment of wastewater was because we stopped funding it in the U.S. Uh, 30 or 40 years ago. In fact, we stopped funding almost all water and wastewater work back then. So here it was an opportunity after working on chlorinated solvents in groundwater for 30 years. I thought it's time to go back and see how far we might go with that. So these are my colleagues. I just show three names of three of them. Professor John Kim, who was a young professor, assistant professor there, who worked on membranes, and that was a big help to us. And I got one of the students named Chung Yun Chin, and he worked with us as a master's student through there, through a PhD. These students working on now, and he's done some wonderful, especially wonderful work for us. So I just want to make sure I, I highlighted him. Well, let's get looking at a bit of the problem. Um, but first, these are the financial support from the various uh, Korean uh, programs that uh, supporting some of the work I'll be talking about. But um, this is one of the problems that we're dealing with now: is the population increase. And I, I was kind of I just put this up, and I thought. I was teaching at MIT in 1960. The world population was three billion. It's now over the doubled, it's seven billion people. And if we had a problem back then with water, think what we have now. And I just hope, I hope for the students here, I hope for humanity that we don't double it again. We just can't, we just can't do it. We're gonna to have to deal with it. Fortunately, it's leveling off now and uh, we just can't have it go up that much or our problems become so much more severe than they already are. Well, along with that is an increase in water use. And uh, we see that directly. Now, I put this up here because I wanna emphasize the three main parts of water, agriculture, domestic, and industrial. And one thing you'll notice is that the industrial is much, I mean, the agriculture is much higher. We use 
most of our water to grow the food that we eat. In fact, it takes about three cubic meters every day, three tons of metric tons of water every day to feed each of you. That's how much water it takes. In California, we use 70 to 80% of our water in California, very short, for agriculture. Now, California produces 50% of the United States' fruits and vegetables, so it's a very important um, agricultural interest, but it takes lots of water. The other thing I want to show you on this that's important is I have that little gray area, and that gray area is water that's used and just dirtied and can be used again. And if you notice on the domestic and industrial side, it's mostly gray area. We dirty the water, but we can use it again. With industry, is, I mean, with agriculture is mostly consumptive use. The water we get evapotranspiration by the plants that they use to grow, and it's gone. We can't use it again. There's an important lesson here is that if you're short of water, you should use it for domestic and industrial. If you can, you should use it for domestic and industrial first so that you can take the best water you have and use it for that. Now, you have to have good water for agriculture, but it doesn't have to be as good, and we can treat it with a normal, relatively inexpensive technology to make it useful for agriculture. So that way we get two hits at it. If we just use it for agriculture, not then one. And I'll show you some of that in California because I think that's a very important principle we have to continue thinking about. Well, of course, with the water going up, the fossil fuel burning has gone up as well, and we know what the problem now is uh, carbon dioxide going up in the atmosphere and uh, causing a greenhouse gas. So that's one of our really big challenges for all of us in the future. I put down below the carbon dioxide going up when I was uh, uh, teaching here. I remember in my carbonate chemistry, I teach water chemistry, and I said the atmospheric concentration is 300 parts per million. We deal in equilibrium with water. Now it's 400 parts per million, and soon it's likely to go up to 500. It's not sloping down, which it should be doing, it's sloping upward. So that's one of the big changes uh, taking place. Well, what is, what is going on now? Well, now we are looking, it's a major, major impact uh, the climate change is having on water. And it's very good. Models are pretty good on a uh, global scale. Uh, they're maybe on the continental scale, they're getting a little bit better. At the regional scale, they're very poor. So we can't really predict what's going on. And what's very difficult now in hydrology is, is predicting what the future water is going to be in a given area. In the past, we looked at the ups and downs, historical ups, and we projected that and said, what was in the past is in the future. It's no longer true. And here's some projections that were, were made of uh, what's likely to happen uh, in the United States. And in the red is showing where the water rainfall and runoff is likely to be less and where it's more likely to be more. And we can certainly see that. And we can see, of course, in the, in the west, where it's already dry, it's expected to get drier. And we're seeing that. And in the east, where it's already wet, it's expected to get wetter. So we both, both ends got big problems, but there are different kinds of problems and uh, exactly how we're going to deal with them as all these changes take place, we don't uh, know, but we've got to put a lot of effort into that. So what's happening out in the West? And last year, Texas had the biggest drought they've ever had. We've got droughts in China, we've got droughts in Australia going on. And uh, this year, this past year in California, we've had the least rainfall ever and recorded, and ever to us is 150 years when you start recording it. But it's the last, by far the last, it's about 40% of the lowest in the past. And um, we're seeing uh, right now the California water plan, which just was built when I was, uh, uh, went there, just started building it. Um, and it's a major supporter for the agriculture as well as for the cities in Southern California. This year, they told the farmers, do not expect any water from them. And that's a major, major cutback, and they're cutting back in the cities as well. So how do we, uh, how are we going to deal with all that? Well, when we look at water, um, and now I think globally, instead of looking at any of our waste as waste anymore, we're looking at a resource. And that's one of the problems, that's one of the things that's going on with two things, of course, population growth, 
but of course it's with economic well-being, and they both together end up demanding many more and more resources. So not only looking at water as reclaiming the water itself, like we've been doing in California, but it's now we're looking at the energy because we would like to get away from fossil fuel use and the energy in wastewater is a bioenergy, it's a renewable energy, and so that makes it very attractive. And the other is the nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, which are used for, for plants. Now, um, 1976 in Orange County Water District, because of shortage of water, they were using the groundwater as their main source of water, and because of that, they were getting intrusion of the sea water into it. And so they had to find a solution. Uh, so at that time, they used a very new process, reverse osmosis. It was at that time, was at, by 1956, it was just a fantasy in a scientist uh, laboratory. Here it is. Uh, by 1976, they were putting on the first really full-scale reverse osmosis to try to claim, claim, take wastewater and convert it into water they could inject into the ground. Now, repel the seawater, but what it went into the uh, system itself. We were doing the organic analysis for them at the time because we were looking at what other organics might be present in wastewaters. Uh, there's a lot of potential carcinogens and uh, with reverse osmosis and the other process they put together worked very well. Well, since then, it's become more of a standard process. They just in 2008 expanded 190,000 cubic uh, meters per day, which is about enough for maybe 250, 300,000 people of water. And they're percolating partly in the ground, the seawater barrier, but as I say, most of that goes into the groundwater and they're putting it into river and letting it percolate in that way. In Singapore, where they have shortage of water, uh, they've got all the water from Malaysia. Um, so they've gone in a big way. And now they have five plants that treat at 550,000 cubic meters a day, enough for close to a million people using reverse osmosis. So we see this technology coming along. But I want to, um, you know, talking about the West and so forth and new technology. But I want to point out here in the East, in, the, in New York City, Manhattan, downtown Manhattan, the luxury apartment, solar apartment. If you look on the top there, you see those green, it's got green roofs, it's got uh, photovoltaic cells on it, but it's got green roofs. And if you go down the basement of this hotel, in the upper right-hand side there, what you see is a sewage treatment plant. They have their own treatment plant using uh, aerobic membrane bioreactors. It's a new, another new concept. The membranes to keep the bacteria, which they need in the reactor to, to treat the waste from passing out and end up with a very clean effluent. You see in the lower right corner there, the membranes that they've taken out of the tank. These are long stringy things like the, like spaghetti or something. But you suck the water through the pores in those membranes to remove the suspended material out. <coughs> and um, get the clean, clean water. And that water then after going through here is used in the, for the green gardens on the top, used in the toilets, used for air conditioning systems. So that's another use we've got to look at. Now, the trouble, the trouble when we look at these advanced treatment systems is they take more, more energy. They, for a conventional aerobic activated sludge treatment, it's commonly used all throughout the United States. It takes about six tenths of a kilowatt hour. <clears throat> We're often required to uh, oxidize, get nitrification, takes more. If we have the membrane bioreactor with the membranes to keep the membranes clean, not to go through the membranes, but it's the cleaning of the membranes that takes the energy. And then if we go to reverse osmosis, we see it goes up much more. Well, I would like to talk about this one here. This is going to be our comparison because I want another look at another process that is also a membrane bioactor. And if you can keep in mind one cubic, meter, cubic kilowatt hour per cubic meter, then uh, just keep that, uh, that number in mind. Now, <laughs> wastewater has organics in it. And organics, if we oxidize them, we can get some energy from them. And the energy we could get from the organics in wastewater is something close to two kilowatt hours. So if we can get that, we could see we could essentially run the process. 
but getting it all out and efficiency and so forth are all involved in it. But at least that's a potential. But I want to bring up something else that we don't often think about in the field is that the wastewater nitrogen, the nitrogen in wastewater, and I have a number of eight tenths of a kilowatt hour. Well, <clears throat> let me explain that. 7% of the natural gas in the world, 7%, is used to extract nitrogen out of the atmosphere by the Haber-Bosch process. Thank you. To, um, to get it out of the atmosphere and make ammonia out of it that we use for fertilizer. I took a look at that, how much energy that is, and then looked, if we assume that all the nitrogen in our wastewater comes from the plants, food we eat, and that food was fertilized, it took eight tenths of a kilowatt hour to take that, that energy out of the to nitrogen out of the air and make the fertilizer out. And uh, so what we do is we put energy and send it back up. Now that doesn't make much sense, does it? We, we get rid of it and they have to take it back out. So why, 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 don't we, why don't we capture more of the wastewater and energy content and why do we go around putting all this energy in to get rid of wastewater of nitrogen? We shouldn't be doing that. We can't afford to do that. We've got to change the way we handle our system. So I want to show you one approach to get around this and get the resources. And this happens to be a plant in Monterey, California, which is uh, halfway up the coast. It's right on the oceans, you see. This is the most agriculture productive area probably in the country. But they use water, groundwater prim primarily, because they don't have much else. And the trouble is, they, because they were using the groundwater here for irrigation, got seawater intrusion, and destroyed that. So the towns around, they decided what they're going to do. They built a treatment plant right in the middle of the agriculture area. And here it is here. I've circled it, the plant. And we see this is all the agriculture area right around it. And then once it's cleaned up, they use it to spray like this. Use drip irrigation in a lot of cases and put it on all your vegetables. So this is artichoke fields. We got some 90% of the artichokes in the country use are here. We got strawberries. You eat strawberries, probably a good chance that many of the strawberries that you have were irrigated by our sewage. But it's after it's cleaned up. And the thing is that treatment plant is more of a conventional treatment plant. They don't have to oxidize the nitrogen. They don't have to remove all the suspended material. They don't have to move all the trace organics. And uh, they take the biosolids that they produce and they use it in anaerobic treatment and cogeneration get about 50% of their power. And the thing is the nitrogen and phosphorus, they don't have to remove it because it's a fertilizer so they're putting on the plants. So they get the water, they get a good portion of the energy, and they get the nutrients. And that's what we should be doing. They're, it's a very in its economical way of handling it. So to the extent that we can, of course we can't do this every place, but to the extent that we can, I think it's just, We've got to look at what we're doing more in that case. And then one I showed in New York, where we're actually using it in New York City and getting them the nitrogen phosphorus by using it there. That makes a lot of sense. You'd say, well, why, why are they doing it in New York? And there's several apartments that do it. Well, the city is subsidizing them because they don't want to build new water to bring it in. It costs a lot of money to bring new facilities. They're very limited in the land. They don't want to keep on expanding the wastewater treatment plant. So it makes sense to help the places to do it locally where you can use the water rather than send it some far away. So this is something I think is very important for us to continue doing. Well, the question that came up that, okay, if we can maybe get some of the water, maybe 50% of the energy if it's a low energy use plant, like a common plant, but why don't, can't we get it all out? Why can't we get more energy? Why can't we produce energy and net energy and still meet the water quality standards and a lower cost than by conventional. So that was the objective that we had when we went to Korea. Now I just want to show you, these are numbers, um, these percentages for my students developed here at MIT <laughs> years ago. Phil has told us about that. But the complex, the degradation anaerobically of organic matter is carried out by a whole range of different microorganisms. Some of them are bacteria, some are archaea, and they all work together to convert hydrolyze, and then some others they pass on to another group, and they do some more little bit of fermentation, and they pass on another group, and they convert another way. There's two different groups of methanogens, entirely different species, that then take 
those compounds and convert them to methane. If you took just a simple compound like glucose, simple sugar, it takes at least four organisms to convert it to methane, four. Aerobically, you could do one. Aerobically, one organism does a lot, and they get all the energy. They get fat in it. Nice thing about this system is they don't get the energy we do. And they don't have much energy, so they don't get very fat, so they don't grow very much, but they're sharing it, sharing it among themselves in a very close pattern. So it's um, an interesting. Now, some people say, well, that's too complex of a process for uh, we are engineers to use. Well, let's look at this. Here on the left side, this in China, there's millions of backyard anaerobic digesters. People have a little couple of pigs in the back and take their waste and put it in there and they get methane. You see down the lower left side there, a woman, a little light up there, that's being lit by the methane she generated from her, um, from her little outdoor digester. And uh, the little oven there, she cooks her rice with it from that. In the middle is one cow dung digester in India. And on the right side are Common, we have commonly used concentrated sludge at wastewater treatment plants converting it to methane gas. But when I was working at MIT, what we were trying to do was to take it from the really concentrated waste to show that we could, you could treat industrial waste, more dilute, more dilute, lesser waste efficiently with this process. And I just wanted to show you a group of them, the Clara Jester in the upper left side, that's for winery, treating winery waste in uh, South, South Africa. The lower one was sugar beet, uh, that was in uh, one with a recycle system, different kind, in uh, Sweden. The upper right corner is the most widely used one, the upflow anaerobic sludge blanket reactor by Lettinga in the Netherlands. And in the lower right corner is a, a fluid, is a, a filter, Bacardi Rum Company and the Environmental Protection Agency told them they had to treat their, their rum, rum waste, that they, which they were putting in the ocean, and of course they grumbled and so forth, but they forced them to do it, so they finally got this and they built this process. Five year, within five years, the methane, the energy that they produced this process paid for the whole thing. So now it's an energy paying. They were fighting it, but here it is. That's what got to convince the industry that this is, you can make money doing this, so it's not just a waste of time. The one I really like is in that fluidized bed reactor in the, the middle there. Actually, it was the first one developed. That was one of my former students from MIT, uh, John Jarris. And it is, in this, you have some particles. In this case, it was a granular activated carbon, little small grains of carbon. The bacteria grow on it, and then the water is moved up in a rapid way to keep it fluidized so that the bacteria, so the, the Grains are trying to drop, the bacteria stay in the system, and the water gets treated. Now this is industrial waste, about 3,000 milligrams per liter COD, 12 hour detention time, about six times higher loading than aerobic treatment systems. The water goes through, comes out the other end. So few biosolids are produced because most of the energy goes off the methane, they don't even have to worry about it. If you had an aerobic system, you'd have to have a tank about five to six times that. You'd have to have settling tanks remove the bacteria. You'd have to hold another system to treat the bacteria that you remove. So it's, uh, this is a way to go. And it's taken a lot in the US, unfortunately, time to get with it. They're growing in usage now, but it is so much more efficient than uh, aerobic uh, treatment systems. So um, this is a paper I wrote from working MIT work. I just want to show I've been interested. I, Got to admit that I, I like the process, so I, I'm a little bit biased here. But nevertheless, you can treat waste very efficiently with it, and low production of biosolids is really a big, big advantage, and that requires low nutrients. And also, we don't have oxygen requirements, and that's why we can load it so much higher. And uh, also, methane is a useful product. So since we don't use oxygen, put all that energy in to put the oxygen in, and yet we get a product back. I think it uh, is really a useful product to, to go forward, even though it's a fairly old one. Now, what we came up with after working and looking at it using the fluidized bed reactor in Korea was this one here. And we call it the Stage Anaerobic Fluidized MBR, or SAFE MBR for short. And on the left side is just like I showed you that fluidized bed reactor that was in Thailand. Granular activated carbon, we recycle the wastewater uh, in through that reactor. The bacteria are growing on those little black beads. They're actually really tiny. 
And uh, so the first one is just a fluidized bed reactor to remove a lot of the wastewater. And then it went to the second one. And what was, what happened? We had this uh, new assistant professor that was working on membranes. We said, well, why don't you just stick a membrane in there and let's see if we can do anything good with it. What we hadn't realized was, you know, so much of research is serendipity, and this is one good one. You put the membranes in, and, and the problem you always have with membranes is fouling. So you have to put a lot of energy to keep them clean. Well, the granule activated carbon particle just rubbing on the membranes cleaned them. We didn't have to. The normal way they do it in these submerged reactors of this kind, the aerobic systems, which there are thousands of around now, and the ones I showed you of Manhattan, is they put in a lot of air just to jiggle the membranes, sort of like shaking the, shaking the dirt off of it, I guess. Uh, they takes a lot of energy. But this is uh, the granite activated carbon. Not only had the bacteria in, but it was rubbing on it. So we, uh, so this was the big breakthrough, and uh, we continue with that. Now, I just want to show you, just so you can see what, uh, what this looks like by a fluidized bed reactor. So I'm going to show you one on the left, a little movie of that. And then on the right, one's how they clean those membranes with long strings of spaghetti. So if this, now, um, I don't know if you can see the gas bubbles coming out. You can see the granular activated carbon particles jumping up and down as the gas is. This is a pretty highly loaded system, but that's methane is coming out of the system as it's treating. It's somewhat of a grain, gray color to it, and that's because the bacteria, and as you go deeper in it, it's blacker because you're seeing the carbon is really black. The gray is really the bacteria growing on the surface. So now um, that's kind of what the granular activated carbon system looks like. And then we passed it from here to the membrane bioreactor. Now, when you look at the membrane bioreactor, you'll see these little yellow streaks. Well, those little yellow things are the membranes sucking the water through. And you'll see the GAC moving along there and polishing it. So let's see if that. So you see it moving wrong on the right side there, moving along those yellow lines there. And as the, as the water goes up, but a lot of gas and a lot of the grand active carbon is just rubbing along those membranes. Very low energy requirement. And that's what was particularly attractive uh, with that one. So we've gone now to a pilot scale of it. We did a lot of laboratory on And uh, here it is in, in the Bouchon uh, treatment plant. It's about a 200 million gallon a day treatment plant. Uh, nitrogen removal plant, very efficient one. But we take the primary effluent. And on the left, you see our lab, our, our pilot uh, fluidized bed reactor. And then we had two different kinds of membrane bioreactors. The one on the far right is the one we've uh, operated for quite a while. And it's a high hollow fiber membranes, just like the ones I showed at the Solaire the apartment building, only those were aerobic. We're putting exactly the same kinds of membranes, but under anaerobic conditions. So there's, there's the pilot plant that we've uh, now run for about a year and a half. And I want to show you the, something about the wastewater characteristics of those who understand what that means. Uh, hydraulic, hydraulic retention time, we started out with the fluidized bed reactor, the first one on the left, about two hours. And then the second hour, we changed from 2.6 2.6 to 4.8. So the total detention time in these reactors is 4.6 to 6.8 hours. Um, so this is just to give you a little background on that. So here's the real BOD removal. Now we started this. We started this process just as winter was coming in. If you look at that upper scale there, it shows temperature, and we I have it regions where the temperature. So you can see the first one is 20 to 15. So as soon as we started doing it, the temperature was dropping. Now, one of the problems is most people you look at the literature and say, "Well, you've got to have 35 degrees." We said, "No, you don't." Uh, that's nice, they grow faster at 35, but if you've got enough organisms, you can do it at lower temperatures. The trouble is they grow very slowly, so that's one limitation. It takes time for the bacteria to grow, especially when it gets colder. So here was starting out, went down 20 to 15. So these are BOD removals, and uh, while we had roughly, still had roughly 85%, it was still quite a range. Then it dropped down in the second range to 14 to 8 degrees, so now we're getting really cold. And um, OK, we're getting, still getting about an average of 85. But then when it started warming up, uh, where the temperature is 15 to 25, you see the efficiency started to increase. 
And we finally got in the summertime where it was 26 to 32 degrees, really warm, and we got really high efficiency. Now, that allowed us to build up a good group of organisms on the membranes, I mean on the GAC. So by this time now, gone through the summer, we've got it really developed. So now we're going back through the winter again. Let's see what happens. Well, the temperature dropped from 25 to 14. You see we lost a little bit of efficiency. It's still about 97. And when it down, went down to 9 to 13 degrees for that three-month period, the average BOD removal is 93%. So that's domestic uh, sewage, and that's pretty good. If we look at COD, now these are effluent concentrations. Can people say, well, fine, percentages, but what's coming out in the effluent? Because that's what we've got to worry about. And we see the first thing as we're starting up. Of course, we're, we're not doing as great. But as soon as we go through the summer, to adapt the organisms, and for the last nine months period, we see that the COD effluent has never been more than 30, in fact, averaging around 27, even in the very cold winter time. And here, BOD, people interested in BOD, so here's the BOD, and uh, we can see these are effluent BOD concentrations, and we can get to see as we go into the summer and then the winter, we see that nine month winter temperature with temperatures of 9 to 13 degrees C, 8 milligrams per liter of the BOD in the effluent. So um, this is US EPA upper limit, 30 milligrams per liter. So a lot of people say anaerobic treatment, you can't go down, you can't do it in cold temperature, you can't do dilute waste, it won't work. And I just want to show you that um, Get the right kind of reactors. The organisms, it's not a limitation of the organisms. It's the kind of reactant that you keep them in there and keep the organisms in the system, keep the suspended solids in there so it degrades and you get very good uh, removals. Uh, let's look at the energy balance for it. Remember once the aerobic membrane bioreactors, I said one kilowatt hour, well, one kilowatt hour is actually a very good one. But here in our system, we see that total out there of 0.227. That's what our energy requirement for that was. Um, and we can see if we look at those two different reactors that most of it was in the bed, fluidized bed reactor. And the main reason, one of the big reasons why it was that high is because uh, the pipe, the recycle pipe was too small. And by looking, and we put the right size pipe in the first one, but not in the second one. And this is what we estimate by just changing the pipe size. Uh, in that recycle line that we should be able to get it down to about 0.133. So uh, this is getting very close. And the amount of energy we're producing can produce by taking the methane from those reactors and converting to electricity about matches that. But we're not using any, this is the primary, if we took primary solid sewage and fed it to the diger, we would about double that of methane, so we would have a net energy plus from the system. Um, those interested in mass balances, we did this. I want to just indicate 10% of the COD was coming out in the effluent, the permeate. Um, about 11% went into biosolids wasting. So aerobically, you're likely to get more like 30 or 40% going into um, biosolids. Um, we had sulfate reduction. That's one thing you get with uh, anaerobic treatment. And you, for that, you don't get methane. We get sulfide, which we have to deal with. But I wanted to show you, this is winter. The reason I put this particular balance up is because of winter. And I just wanted to show you something. We see the methane, total methane, is about 60% of the COD is converted into methane. But at those cold winter temperatures, most of it's dissolved in the water that's coming out. When we deal with these dilute wastewaters, that's what we have to deal with. And we have to be able to figure out how to get that out of the water. That's still a challenge. Uh, I don't think it's very, not very soluble. It's a very insoluble gas, but we've got to do it economically and so forth. So I just want to indicate that. Now, the biosolids production, I told you, is something special. It's 0.065 kilograms that we got from uh, treating domestic wastewater, which is about one quarter less than that that you get from an aerobic system. But it's already treated. It's already digested. So we've gone through that process within here. Um, so that's, that's, I think this is, might be the biggest advantage, cost advantage of that system. Now, we never chemically clean the membranes. And we, um, so it's been a month, year and a half 
When you do an aerobic system, they usually put chemicals through there to clean off the falling uh, for theft. You can't keep them shaking it, but once a month and often more often than that. We didn't do it for a year and a half. But we see this is the pressure, transmission pressure. This is how much our suction, how much suction we are putting on to get the water through. And it's because of that, it went up and went up and up. So we slowed down the flow rate through it. And that's something we got. So we know that in the future, we've got to do chemical cleaning periodically um, so that we can get a higher flux and make that uh, a better part of it. But I want to show you something. And here's, here's encouraging. This just came out, or it just came out uh, about um, going through in a laboratory study where we did the study over a, a year's time. And I wanted to show you something. This is only a 2.3 hours. This is kind of a goal that we're shooting for. 2.3 hour hydraulic retention time. 2.3 compared to six in an aerobic system. Typical. Energy in this particular one, because, because of the constraints and everything, the fluid mechanics of and so forth, is only 0.05 kilowatt hours. And I think we can achieve that in a full scale. You know, we, this is you go a thousand times up from this. That's what we did in the pilot plant. We we're a little bit careful on loading it and so forth. But I think once we get around and get around some and optimize it, we'll be able to, to do, do that. If we can do that, it's going to be really a big advantage. Um, I, one thing, you know, there's a lot of serendipity, things we didn't know. And someone said, how can you get to 2.3 hours with it? And the reason you would ask that question is if you look at others who are using this gas sparging to keep membranes, they, if you have, we have a wastewater sewage has valves of suspended solids in it. They come into the reactor and they're treated. Okay. Some of them are refractory and so they build up in the reactor as do the bacteria. Now, in the normal gas barge system, the bacteria and the volatile solids are all held together. If you want to treat at a very low temperature like we're treating, you have to keep the bacteria in, in the order of 100 days or more. You've got a couple hour detention time in the liquid, but you're keeping the bacteria in for 100 days or a long time. So in the normal gas barging, the volatile solids coming in are held that long too. So they're normally operating at 6, 12, or 8, 12 hours, and maybe longer detention time. And their suspended solids in the reactor that are against the membranes are in the range of maybe uh, 8 to 15 grams per liter. Here, we separate in our system the bacteria growing on the GAC, and we keep those in the reactor. But the valves and suspended solids are light, and they're being circulated around, and that's where we waste. So we can waste them any way we want. And you notice that with our, with our reactor that had a six hour detention, well actually the laboratory reactors, with those short detention times, our vault suspended solid is only about a half a gram or more. And so we're not changing the viscosity of the liquid. Uh, we're not having a lot of uh, bacteria, of suspended solids going against the membranes. And so I think that's why it's working quite well in the laboratory at even a short hours, of uh, two hours. Um, so. Now, another thing, you know, we said, well, we're using granular activated carbon in there, and that's a good sorber too. So it's got lots of advantages. So what, let's look at that. So we have our colleagues in uh, Taiwan who are running some laboratory systems on this on domestic sewage. And so they measured um, 25 pharmaceuticals. There's a lot of concern about pharmaceuticals and wastewater. People keep saying, you can't use this on irrigation, can't use it for this because of pharmaceuticals. So they um, measured 25 compounds, and 19 of them were present in the primary effluent that they were studying. And they found that the system, the anaerobic system, removed 86 to 100% removal, but most of them, the median was 97% removal. So um, we don't know. We don't know why it was removing them. We don't know if it's still a system been operating for well over a year, year and a half. And is the GAC still absorbing it, or is it being degraded? We don't know. But uh, this was really a very encouraging step. So we had um, we had one at uh, Bill Mitch at Stanford and Dave Sudlack at Berkeley, who are 
um, took some samples from our Korean one. And this is the first one they have. They got another new sub today. Um, and we compared, because we have the aerobic treatment system going on, we took samples from the, the primary sewage going in and from the, the safe MBR system and then from the aerobic treatment. And what you'll notice is that with disinfection byproducts is something we worry about today. So they were looking at the change from the primary effluent disinfection byproducts form when you disinfect chlorinate, and then compared it with what they got in the two different systems. And we found that the safe MBR system uh, got a much better, quite a reduction in all of the formation products formed. But the aerobic system, it reduced two of them, but not as much on average, and two of them actually increased through aerobic treatment. So, um, and then we looked at a smaller range of uh, pharmaceuticals, safe MBR system, like they found in Taiwan, 96% removed on average, and the aerobic system was only 69%. Now there's transformation products, so sometimes you remove a compound and form something else, which could be worse. Well, so they were measuring a group of transformation products, and they too are all removed in the anaerobic system, but they were either produced more because they're treating it aerobically or increased in concentration. So this, was, uh, this is a new, another new finding, and one that uh, we find very encouraging, but of course we got a, a lot more to learn on, on that. Now I just wanted to get towards the end here and talk about, I mentioned that Monterey wastewater treatment plant that I thought was really doing the right thing. They're using the water for agriculture. They're using a traditional treatment system. Uh, they're getting energy back from cogeneration and methane, and they're using the nitrogen and phosphorus. What we're trying to do is something better, and uh, I want to point out one thing. If we use this safe MBR system, it's got about the same detention time, so it's about the same footprint of the aerobic treatment systems, which you see circled there. They have two different ones. One's more of a trickling filter, and the other is a, a, a activated sludge, so it's a combination. So that, um, but if we, if we look at the other parts of this system, you see the, the round circles on the left? Those are the settling tanks that they need, because they don't have membranes, so they need settling tanks. And way down here in this lower corner is the sand filtration. So to get it disinfected well enough, they have to go through sand filtration. So our membranes do that. That's all part of the system I've shown up there. The biosolids that are produced are taken over into those digesters on the far right side. But ours are already digested, so we don't need that either. So this, the footprint is really small. So we have membranes. They're more expensive. GAC is expensive. But the biosolids we produce, the treatment of solids, biosolids, which is a huge problem in aerobic system, we get around it from this kind of a, a process here. Um, you know, it's, we're doing this in Korea. We got another one that's starting up about a month, about a month. Maybe it started up this, I think, in this month in Singapore. Taiwan's interested in doing it. And we don't have any in the United States because there's no money to do it in the United States. Um, but the Stanford University, um, with some of my colleagues there, got very interested in, in all the overall re water resource recovery. And so they're building a group of systems. Stanford has been very supportive, gave us $2 million to build this uh, recovery center. Uh, Bill and uh, his wife, Kodiga, a former alumni of Stanford gave us another million and a half to build this resource center. And originally, Professor Craig Criddle, who initiated this, was going to put in an aerobic membrane bioreactor. And then we saw these results from Korea and said, we switched all that. We're putting an anaerobic one. Stanford, uh, we have golf courses and we have a lot of need for irrigation and, and recycling of water. We use about 5 million gallons a day, and rather than sending our waste down to Palo Alto and throw it in the ocean after it's through, and whether and pay in San Francisco a lot of money for their good water that comes from the sheriff, they're going to recycle this. And uh, looking to the future, uh, they may end up using this process if it all works out, and we can convince people doing it for irrigation and other uses on the campus. So I uh, really appreciate their looking forward to that. and. Uh, we hope we can see how that will go. 
Well, we have a lot of future research needs for that. We need to optimize it, and that's what we're going to try to be doing at Stanford and be doing at Singapore as well. Uh, we have to get find out a good economical, low-cost way to get the, the methane out. Uh, that's certainly recognized to be a need for these systems. And uh, people keep on saying, well, yeah, if I put it in a river, we've got to remove phosphorus and nitrogen. So say, OK, maybe we have to address that. But we know the phosphorus removal comes out easy. We've done that with ferric chloride. It removes the sulfides as well. Ammonia nitrogen, we've got to recover that as well. Um, the new process, Animox, developed in Europe, is really a good process and works out especially well here because it doesn't require organic matter and the amount of oxygen is only three quarters of a mole of oxygen rather than two moles that are usually used in the normal nitrification, denitrification system. New group of organisms, new, uh, new approach, which I think is a, just a wonderful one coming through. Um, now we can ion exchange or capture with ammonium selective resins. That's already been done. They need to be optimized. And uh, my colleague at Stanford's got one called the can-do process, which he recovers the nitrogen energy from it. So we'll just have to see. But there's a lot of potential ways of working on resources. And I just wanted to show you uh, this particular one and where we're going with it. So um, I just want to convince you that you can remove anaerobically, dilute, treat domestic wastewater, temperature down to nine degrees, and get highly efficient treatment. In addition to that, the biosolids production, which is a lot of people say is 50%, 40 or 50% of the cost of a normal treatment plant, and 90% of the headaches, we want to get rid of that. And uh, if you can take the effluent from this, uh, we think it's going to be it's as good and maybe better than even the aerobic membrane bioreactors for use on um, uh, agriculture resources so we can get the nitrogen and phosphorus. So um, I just want to I just want to say something else. I don't know whether this process will ever go any place, where it will go, how far it will be used, but we're going to pursue it as far as we can. But even so, I think it shows that we can do the process, the technical process, that do a lot better in meeting the challenges that we have today rather than amplify them like we've been doing with our traditional processes that we use up to this time. Maybe there's a lot of others. People are working on uh, bowel fuel cells. Very interesting science going on there right at the moment. I'm not talking about them here because their, their deficiency is still a huge problem with them. The cost is a big problem. But there are new directions to go. The Animox process, which I mentioned, is a wonderful process. Why didn't we, how did it take so long to discover this? It's a natural process going on all over. And we just didn't open our eyes to it. People in the Netherlands did. Um, so we've got to, we've got to look forward to that. I indicated also a real problem in the United States. We haven't been funding the research. The newness, most of the newness has come in foreign countries. When I go to the International Water Association's research conferences throughout the world, I see very few American researchers. In the past, we were the leaders. What has happened to us? Why are we, we became enamored with the technologies we developed back 30 or 40 years ago and think that's, if forever. We didn't realize about carbon problems with fossil fuels. We didn't realize problems with a global change and so forth that's going on with the population increase and a resource deficiency. We've got to change. And uh, I just want to encourage somehow we got to change in this country. We have to get the, our engineers to recognize our facilities. We built all our treatment facilities, most of them in the country, 40 or 50 years ago. They're wearing out. We've got to change them. What are we going to do? We're going to put in the same thing when we find out that there are newer ones coming around. Um, people say, well, it's too risky to try something new. Uh, but, um, you know, I know a lot of aerobic treatment plots have been keep on getting called in and because they're failing, they have a problem. They've got bulking sludges and so forth and so on. So it's not that our conventional ones don't have risks. They do. And uh, putting in these new problems maybe involves a little bit of risk, but we can... Risk is not something we should avoid. 
It's something we've got to manage. And uh, I think we can't afford not to go with some of the new technologies and uh, make a greater effort. Now, we've got a lot of students here at MIT. These are the best students in the country. And I'm very confident that uh, you see the problems and you'll go out. And I'm, I'm sure I'm very confident that uh, you'll make big change in the future. Uh, we need it. It's really critical. Water is uh, very scarce in so many parts of the world, not only in California, as you know, but many places. And it's really important for us to uh, address uh, these issues in a much more constructive way than we have. So I feel really optimistic about the students, and I wish you well. I wish I could be here because I think it's a really exciting as well as important time to be in the, in the water field. So good luck to you all, and thank you so much for inviting me here. Right. I got a big bright, some light shining in my eyes. I can't see anything. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, I, I went to hear a talk yesterday at the Graduate School of Design by somebody who was uh, talking about Niagara Falls. And he, one theme of his talk was that the way of understanding the falls as a resource had some negative consequences for how it developed. And I appreciate what you're saying about understanding wastewater recovery as a resource, but I wonder if, stepping back, there may be another better way of understanding water that may lead to better results environmentally. So that's a kind of general philosophical question. But specifically, um, you touched on methane the methane aspect of this. I wonder if you have any much, could you say a little more perhaps about addressing the methane dimension of this given that it's a, a greenhouse gas and some of the problems that have been identified with it. And I'm also curious about how you see the water issues involved with fracking, where you have on the one hand massive use of, <laughs> mass, I, know it's, I know it's a sort of separate, but it's related. Question. <laughs> uh, the massive use of water and then in turn what some have identified as potential risks to existing aquifers and, and water resources. Well, you, you of course brought up a lot of uh, broad, important uh, issues. Um, you say you wondered if uh, there aren't better ways of handling our water resources. I think it's up to all of you to come up with the better ways. That's what we need. Uh, we need the thinking. Uh, they were put up a long time ago, and our thinking was certainly very different than we are today. We look back and say, why did we ever do that? And I'm kind of asking you, to, why are we doing what we're doing? Why don't we change? So we're looking for all the solutions we can. Niagara Falls, I mean, it's or some water. That water Great Lakes are used for certainly for drinking, but they're certainly used for recreation. They're used for all the fishery, fishery resources. They're used for power. They're used between two countries and numerous states. So it's a, it's a big, complex water system. People say it's full of water, but if you look at the renewable part of that water, it's pretty limited when you look at the population that's being served at. So it is something that has been, needs to be more con continuously looked at. And uh, if there are better ways of doing it, we certainly got to do that. Methane, methane is a, a huge problem. It's uh, something about our global warming. Something like 15% of the climate change comes about from the methane. A lot of it's coming from agriculture. A lot of it's coming, some of it's coming from belching of cows, for example. Um, and um, uh, some of it comes, a lot of it comes from gas production. Some of it may come from our septic tanks where we have anaerobic treatment where we don't um, Treat it. A lot of it, uh, there's been a lot of work on anaerobic treatment of municipal wastewaters, partially, you can say USAB process in Brazil and so forth, and they generally let the methane go up in the atmosphere. We can't afford to do that. If we're going to do this anaerobic treatment, we've got to collect the methane and not let any of it escape. How much it looks like out of normal treatment plants where we're using it, the safeguards are pretty good. We've got to check into that more. 
but it's like any energy source. It's a great energy if we use it. It's a great resource, and it's a terrible resource if we lose it. So uh, I agree that methane is something. But again, don't avoid making it because if, you know, make it, but use it. And that's what you've got to do because it is a renewable resource. It's, and that's what we've got to do. As far as fracking, well, I'm not, a, you know, I think we've got to, fracking is a big, big issue. Uh, there we're using it primarily, well, we're using it for getting oil too, but we're using it for methane, uh, getting more natural gas out and methane. Um, methane is a fossil fuel. So down the way, I say it's, it's better than coal. And it looks like for the short period of time, it's, that part might be better, but the long term, it's still a fossil fuel. And if everybody in the world had enough fossil methane to use it, we'd be still in a big problem that we are. So I, I think we've got to be very careful at, and build up the renewable resources that we have. If we'd support it more, subsidize it like we do other things, I think we would we get there. But that's big thinking in the, in the long run down the way that we all have to do and all get uh, engaged in. Thanks for coming. Four years ago, I was at a local scientific conference, and there was an abstract for a talk in which the researchers doubled the efficiency of anaerobic digestion of chicken manure by adding iron oxide nanoparticles. I'm wondering if you thought about nanoparticles or any nanomethods for increasing anaerobic digestion? I'm trying to think of, should I give you a short answer or a long answer? <laughs> uh, when I was at MIT and I had a student named Dick Spies and uh, we were trying to do anaerobic treatment on simple wastewaters and we couldn't get it to last long. So we were trying to look at nutrients that might be present in, in um, anaerobic sludge. So he was filtering this stuff through a sieve, a sieve made of, in the laboratory, metal sieve, you know, made of some kind of iron, steel, whatever. And he had been using this for a days and it was corroding. And so one of the students said, God, look at this all croating. Let's probably just throw some nails in the digester and it'll make it work. So he, well, so he threw in some iron and sure enough, it built up, it went better. So iron is a very critical element. If you don't have enough, you really need it. And we, that's one thing we find out. So I'm just telling you, yes, iron is important, but when you got enough in, it's not gonna make any difference. So it, I don't know the history of what you had there, but I certainly can just say, yes, you need enough iron or you're gonna have real trouble because it's a critical element. The other one he found was nickel, which at the time, no one thought nickel was an essential nutrient for microorganisms, but it is, for, at least for the methanogens. So you gotta have, you gotta have the balance in. And generally, domestic wastewater generally does because it's got you know, a mixture of everything we put in it. It's got all kinds of good nutrients in. So it's a great substrate, but uh, I don't know in the case you're bringing up just whether what I talked about was there something else. Okay. Just a question on the safe and VR process. Um, so uh, how close to energy neutral is your process? So what are your pumping costs? Well, uh, well essentially, essentially, in the laboratory, we, we produce a lot more methane. In the field, uh, because of the, the wrong size piping and the low, longer, a little bit longer detention time, we were just about neutral with it, especially if we take the primary sludge. If you had a more concentrated wastewater, it'd be easy to do it, and we had a pretty dilute wastewater. So if you get real dilute, it's gonna be really tough. If you got more concentrated, you get a lot more methane. So it's a balance. But I think for most domestic wastewaters, once we get it optimized, you'll be producing, producing energy. I mean, electric energy. I mean. We get a lot more energy in the methane, but we got to get it into electricity to run the system. And so that's why we have to go through this energy efficiencies. But I'm sure we can get, I'm sure with domestic sewage, normal, we can do it fine. Yes? I went to a dentist at Deer Island a few months ago, uh -huh. where I learned that uh, the biggest energy expenditure in the city is wastewater treatment. That worried me a lot because fossil fuel will run out in my lifetime. So why are we wasting so much energy on wastewater treatment? 
Is it just short-sightedness? Why aren't we working harder? Well, let me, let me ask, answer. The, um, in the United States, we use about 2 to 3% of our electrical energy for wastewater treatment. So that's far from most of it. In Europe, it's the same. Now, I don't know where, that, where they got that number, but uh, it's as far as using that for wastewater, water conveyance and wastewater treatment, it's not right. And that's, and that's, um, and that's everything else in their economy was really down. <laughs> but in the, certainly in our economy, in European economies, it's only a, a few, per, few percent. And well, that's what we're trying to, it's, it's few percent, but every, we gotta tackle every few percent. <laughs> Because um, if we don't tackle our 2% and you tackle the, that and everyone else does, our 2% will keep on getting bigger and bigger. You know? So we've all got to do our little bit where we are, and this is where we are in the water field. I think those numbers I gave you would sound awfully high to me, and I'd, I think I'd question them. But the, but the 2 to 3, 4% three, of just electrical energy is, is probably a good number. Okay. In the back. Way in the back. The uh, the question was, I believe, how much nitrogen got through our system? Well, we don't get much into biological formation since we're not producing any. So most of it, so our effluent ammonia, nitrogen, which comes out of ammonia, is about equal to our influent ammonia plus organic nitrogen. So most of the uh, nitrogen comes right on through the anaerobic system as we have constituted it. So if we either have to use it directly or we have to have some recovery process if we want to recover it. That answer your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, to me, it feels a little bit like a race against time as we either rebuild our traditional wastewater treatment plants or do switch to these new technologies. But can you talk a little bit about the cost differential? For the process I proposed versus the traditional way? Yeah. Well, I think we have to get, um, we have to make, we'll have to go through that yet. I think we're getting pretty close. I think you make a rough estimate. As I indicated, we have higher costs for membranes. We have higher costs for the granular activated carbon. Now, the granular activated carbon uh, in Taiwan, I showed you that one fluidized bed reactor. They had put that one in operation 12 years ago, and they never replaced the granular activated carbon. So I think we can keep it in for a long time and write it off over a period of time. Uh, the membranes, uh, people ask us, we aren't in the GAC hurting the membranes. We've operated them two years, and we haven't seen that yet. Aerobic systems, they try to estimate membranes might last about 10 years. That's a cost. So we have some cost. Uh, what we're offset, we don't have to have so the sewage, the settling tanks, we don't have to have sand filtration, we don't have to have much digesters, we don't have biosolids transport. So there's a lot of cost savings, there's some increase in costs, and how that will all balance, I think, depends a little bit upon location. But we're just, you know, this pilot plant was the first one ever built, and the first one ever built is not the best. They always, if you build something and it really works, and it is really working well, that you can improve it, putting in some effort. And most things, when you look at it, improve them with time, you really improve them over maybe even maybe over magnet order of magnitude. So we'll just have to see. So the first one is just, you know, don't say that's the only part. So I think we can get a lot better. Our membranes, uh, cost of membranes have come way down and they're still improving. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of potential for the costs coming down. So I don't, um, how much, I don't know. But I, I, think it's, I think already it's probably competitive with aerobic system if we look at the whole, whole part, at least in lots of locations. Speaking of in, improvements, uh, you showed uh, some plots of the efficiency of the system after uh, a number of hundred of days. Now, yes. I'm interested in where this, uh, this increase in efficiency comes from. Is that the, the species composition inside the, the tanks? Or? Well, what it is, it takes a lot of bacteria. I mean, to get the high, to get a really high efficiency, you need a lot of organisms. 
So to get a lot of organisms, we have to keep them in a long time. Now, the, anaerobic, the methane, the bacteria, the critical organisms, at 35 degrees, the doubling time is about four days. Now, if you take aerobic organisms, they might double in 20 minutes. <laughs> so they grow fast. Well, OK, four days. You'd, every time you drop 10 degrees, it about doubles the doubling time. So maybe go with 25, maybe it's eight days. Drop down to 15, maybe it's 16 days. Get down to 10, I don't know. Well, you, you've got to build up a big population. So if you start from just a small seed to begin with, it takes a long time to get enough organisms in that system. And that's what you are seeing. And that's always the thing with the anaerobic treatment. It's going to take you a long time. But once you get it, you've got it. Once you get it, then you can maintain them in the system. And uh, you know, that's, that's the other side of low biosolids is they, they grow very slowly. Um, you know, the uplow anaerobic sludge blanket reactor, which is the most common one in, in use for industrial waste, they make money selling because that biosolids, when they start a new reactor, you know, they go, gee, I'll give you $25,000, $30,000 for your, some of your seed because I can start it up quicker, you know. So uh, I, think, I think if we got these things started, that organisms and systems would be worth a lot because a lot of people like to buy them from you. And, you know, I'm not sure how much you can how much you can produce, but what you produce, what you have in there, I think is worth a lot. We normally seed our digesters with something, you know, something that's a higher concentration, so it doesn't take as long. But the growth rate is the problem for why it takes so long, and we've got to have a long, a lot of minute. Okay. Right back. In Europe, there, in Europe, there were attempts in the 80s and 90s to use the waste such and surplus such for fertilization, also to reuse the nutrients. But those were not continued because the heavy metals and the and so on had accumulated in the slush. If you want to use your um, the affluent for fertilization, where do those go in your system? Well, I think that's uh, that's another good question. The um, the metals um, metals are one of the problems, especially something like selenium in the sludges that people get concerned about. Certainly, you can't put on too much. Um, how much? You know, a lot of places, we use a lot of them in California, a lot of the sludges for fertilizer. So, um, and uh, the, our EPA has certain standards on it, but metals is something you have to be concerned about. But again, it's, it's I want to bring up this risk business. Because just because, you know, because they're metals, a lot of the metals we need ourselves, right? We have to have certain amounts of trace metals. So at certain concentrations, they're really good for you. It's too much of a good thing is bad for you, and that's of any, everything. So we've got to really balance it. And uh, I think what we have to do is be a little bit more careful about wanting to be so risk-free that we get into other really big problems and costs. Um, just where we want to go on that, I don't know. But that's but the metals is is a, a problem, and selenium is probably one of the biggest ones there. That we just have to control how much we put on the soil, so it doesn't get into the food that we eat. And um, and the other one is, of course, the pathogens in there. We have to you know disinfect it. So, but uh, but we use it in a lot of places, and it's uh, where we're using it. In the United States, one of the big changes that took place was to have um, source control, like with industrial waste, it cannot put metals into the sewage because they were putting a lot of toxic things to biological systems. That's been prohibited now, and that has made biological systems a lot more reliable. And I think that applies to much of the metals as well. Okay. Oh. Go ahead. Um, so you mentioned in one of your um, pie charts that about 11 percent of Yeah, the question had to do with the sulfide. We had sulfate reduction, and one of the things to find that sulfate is uh, some bacteria like sulfate use it as an electron acceptor, use it as a source of oxygen, <laughs> breathing with sulfates. The um, and in the process, we end up with sulfide. And sulfides are toxic. They're odorous. Uh, we've got to keep them out. They're corrosive. Uh, so we have that to deal with. Um, the sulfate, 
the sulfides that you get are a function of the sulfates coming in. Now, what we found in the warmer temperatures, all of our sulfate was reduced. In the wintertime, we only got about half of it reduced, so those organisms slowed down a bit. But, but uh, what can we do with it? I think we just have to, anytime we keep wastewater, we look at the sulfates and we estimate how much of our methane we're going to lose and how much sulfide we've got to deal with. In a municipal waste, it's not going to be a toxic problem. In an industrial waste, it often is where they have high concentrations. So um, there are a lot of sulfide removal processes, both from the gas and from the water uh, that we know about. And of course, they cost money. But so we can do it. It's not, not that uh, there's not ways of handling it, but it's, it is one of the things we have to deal with. Yeah. Can I have a follow-up on that? Yeah. Uh, given the, the theme, is it possible that sulfite would be a suitable anaerobic disinfectant? Uh, the question is, would sulfide be a dis good disinfectant? An anaerobic disinfectant. Disinfectant, anaerobic disinfectant. As opposed to using all the oxidants that we use. Um, Has anybody ever looked at the various pathogens and when you put them in a millimolar sulfide, do they like it? <laughs> millimolar. Um, well, I've been trying to think. You get, a, you, get a, you get it quite a bit higher than millimolar is pretty small. There could be some aerobic organisms in their effect, and there could be some pathogens that are affected. I don't know. I don't know. It's worth looking at. The point is that you're doing all this anaerobically. Yes. And you have to worry about disinfectant at the end. Yes, we do. Is there a way to do an anaerobic disinfection? Uh, good idea. Anybody got want to try that? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see, yeah. So they, we, haven't, we haven't yet looked at the disinfection. We know we're filtering, so we're removing uh, most, probably with the, we're using about 0.03 micron filters, so we're probably removing most bacteria. But we'll still, we've got virus and so forth. We'll still, still want to do disinfection. It'll be interesting to see if we have less organisms in an aerobic system, but I don't know if we, it's kind of hard to do. But, um, you know, the... This, I brought up the pharmaceuticals and so forth, which everybody is bringing that up a lot these days, pharmaceutical, personal care products, because we know there are high concentrations going into our water. So we were surprised here, and I have one of my colleagues, he says, well, he, he said, uh, Bill Mitch, he said, well, he had been done in studying with sulfide unactivated carbon and found that compounds degraded quite readily. So it may be, you know, whether that's involved in the disappearance of pharmaceuticals, I don't know. Yeah, so Bill's argument is the carbon acts as the electrode and takes the electrons from the sulfide and, and yeah. essentially reduces yeah. the pharmaceuticals. So that's maybe another value of the GAC. <laughs> so, so we got a lot of things to look at. So it's just, it's just kind of open up on that. Okay, everybody's exhausted. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, thank you. Thank you all very much. I appreciate you coming.